Hey, everybody, welcome Thursday afternoon live sales training. Missed last week, so this week we'll double up, which I don't know what that means. Maybe it's double up in spirit, Leandro. Got Leandro with me for the first time in many, many weeks here in the room. Very happy about that. We got some people joining right now, so we'll continue to, hey, Val, hey, everybody. Uh, we'll continue to hold on just a moment. A little small talk, right? Can I tell you? And I know everybody can um, agree, especially if I make it this large, Leandro, which is the topic of grief. Man, grief's a weird thing. Man, I thought I was good, right? And just, it doesn't take but a just a subtle breeze to open up the wound, man. Yeah, so I had a couple of days where I um, started wanting to feel a little sorry for myself, you know what I mean? Well, I just grief, you know, just that losing dad and it hitting me in different ways throughout the week. So it's kind of been um, a tough couple of weeks from that standpoint, or not a couple of weeks, but moments, right, that were new to me in this uh, grief stage. So if anybody of you out there has something that you're grieving, know that uh, you're not alone. And uh, you still pressing, right, Leandro? I called everybody and, and asked if they would uh, go ahead and suspend their life so that I could, you know, take a break. And everybody's like, nah, we got to keep going. <laughs> life just kept going. Hey, Miss Dana Boyd. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Listen, these chapters right now, If you, for those of you who are reading, and I know that there are people who attend that haven't read it, or maybe they're way ahead, way behind, doesn't matter. Uh, especially for today, I had a been thinking a lot today about the format and and I'm always one to you know want to change things and it gets me in trouble sometimes but that's okay um put these on real quick see how I look now Quincy's <laughs> plus they're like dirty like, dude throw your glasses <laughs> um so I thought this week I mean certainly we can go over some of these principles but you know what I did Leandro I started thinking about you know some of the things that we're going through now like the last uh, chapter we did was drop a honey right don't approach people in an adversarial manner because people are counterpunchers, right? If you show up and clench fist, the, uh, the, 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 the adage is that somebody's going to clench them even harder than you do when you come at them. So again, it goes back to this kind of deeper level of thinking on really identifying what we're trying to achieve in, in, in any moment, right? We can make it grand, like trying to achieve becoming the best Matthew that I can be, or it could be just in the moment trying to achieve that. Like I want to be a purveyor of peace in my life. I, I, I have been called at times, Leandro, to be an agent of change, um, and I know what that's like, and, and I certainly have the demonstrative personality to pull it off, but my innate nature is to be a, 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 a purveyor of peace. I don't want to disturb anybody. I don't want my existence, and this is just me, guys, but I, don't, I literally don't want my existence to be an encumbrance on someone else, or as, you know, in a book, in a book, it would say a stumbling block, right? You don't want to cause your fellow brother or sister to stumble, and so as we go through and we start looking at these things, I look at more practical applications. And in this next chapter, it talks about the Socratic method. Has anybody ever heard of the Socratic method? It sounds fancy, but it's really simple. Um, and that is getting people to say yes. We've all heard the concept, right, of in sales, that the old adage that is you want to ask questions that engender a yes. Because a no, when you say no and when you disagree with something or you come up against something, there's absolutely neurological, biological uh, activities that happen. It, it's just a fact. And those activities do not uh, lend well to being open-minded and wanting to agree and find similarities in thought process. Matter of fact, it does the complete opposite. So the idea is that when you're talking to somebody, you want to get them to say a system of yes. Uh, you know, why are you inquiring about CBD? Is it pain? Is it anxiety? I'm in pain. How long have you been in pain? 10 years. Man, I bet you are wishing that's going, aren't you? I mean, that's just my way of doing it. Yeah, man. And just get people to say yes. So in concept, I think we can cover that as a, you know, an educated group here in just a few minutes. We don't need a lot of time to talk about the value of getting people to say yes. We could do role play if we were in different kind of training settings where it would be like, hey, I, I, I'm going to see this person. You know, how would you start getting yes answers from that person? And certainly we can do that. But the thing that I thought of, and I'm thinking so much these days, you guys, you know me, I can be uh, to an exhaustive measure introspective. And a lot of the things that we're learning in this book about human behavior, about how to uh, how to navigate and, and put ourselves what I call and, and I should coin it because I don't remember reading it anywhere. I call putting ourselves on the right side of human behavior. Right. There's exceptions to every rule, but it's almost like blackjack. Right. If I if I base my decisions on a certain set of rules that I set in my mind, my odds are better to win. And that's what we're doing. We're just trying to get ourselves on a, in a position to have better odds. There's no manipulation. There's no absolutes. Um, so as I think about yeses and I think about that positivity and you start reading about and I did even a little bit more research in the book on 
some of the biological effects um, of saying no, of, of being confronted with something that we disagree with or, or uh, you know, having kind of a, a, a mental battle with something. So as I read through this book, I realize that in our culture, it's almost like it's the antithesis because of, of what we're learning. Because here it says, seek to find common ground. When we're dealing with people, seek to find, and we, we dealt with this in the previous book, right, Leandro? One of the greatest you know, relationships, everybody communicates, few connect. To connect, you have to have a relationship. To have a relationship, it first starts with common ground. And a lot of times, companies and organizations, they'll create their own common ground, like team building events, road courses, you know, anything, so that they create a common experience for their people, so that if nothing more, you know, think about an international company with people from different cultures, backgrounds, you know, everything, how do we get common ground to a sort among the variety of personalities and people? And sometimes they have to create it. Hey, uh-oh, are you doing a cameo? <laughs> are you doing a cameo? No. Oh, man. Oh. Everybody on, everybody's... It's so happy to see you. They're calling for a cameo, honey. Okay. Yes, please. Hi, yes. everybody. <laughs> my better seven-eighths. A lot of people say, hey, me my better half. That would be inaccurate at best. Be deceptive on my part. <laughs> better seven eights. So when we think about some of the concepts that we're learning in here, to me, it's almost like our culture is counter to that right now. So this is something that I mentioned before, but we know that people like people that like people, right? It's hard to like a hater. It's hard to like someone who's negative about other people. It it's not hard to join them, right? You know, misery loves company. But people like people who like people. That's human. That's a human intuition. That's a human behavior. People do business with people they like. So in this thing where it says try to find common ground, it makes me go back to that 360 degree thinking concept that I've been sharing with you guys that I'm trying to, again, uh, articulate. And the idea is, and, and I know most of you on here, we do have some new people, uh, but the idea is we are kind of hardwired to think linearly meaning left, right, up, down, right? Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal. It's just, it doesn't matter what side you fall on. The point of it is that there, we identify things as opposites or we identify things kind of uh, what's different. Think about the old, uh, the old game, you know, you had the two pictures, you know, pick what's different in these pictures. It's so I think, in fact, I know that intuitively we think like that. When we come in contact with someone, I think the intuitive nature, and I'm talking about subconscious, Consciously, it happens too, but I'm talking about the subconscious where when someone stands next to us or enters our presence and is radically different than us. I mean, just think about it, whatever you can. I saw a guy the other day with like a hundred face, you know, pins, right? He was, you know, one of those guys, like circus guy type thing. So when that dude stands next to me, you know, my intuition would be like, dude, that dude is way different than me. But the point of this is, is to train ourselves to seek to find those things that make us similar. And I would add, let's, I want this to be a more open session. I told Leandro, I don't have like, you know, 30 minutes or 45 minutes worth of notes to cover today. I wanted to change the atmosphere a little bit of this. I'm actually getting bored with the format, to be honest with you. I, I hope you guys aren't, but if you are, it's okay. Cause I am. Um, and I told Leandro, I said, it's going to be, you know, pretty much dependent on, uh, you know, how much you guys want to interact. And I don't want to force you if it doesn't happen organically, it's okay. Um, but let me ask a question, and it can be rhetorical, or if someone feels like they, they want to answer or, or even expound on it, please do so. But in, in, a, in a giving environment, someone would say, hey, if I take a look at your checkbook, what is that going to tell me about what you find important in life? And I believe it will tell you a lot, right? So let me ask this question. If I were to look at, or if, not me, but if anyone were to look at your uh, internet presence, call it social media, how you interact in emails, I mean, on an internet presence, what would they think of you? Would they know you, now here's the question, would they know you by the things that you don't like and that you're against and that you're opposed to? Or would they know the things that you do like, that you're for, and that you're an advocate of? Let's take a moment to think about that. I don't really engage much on social media, but I know I am an exception to the rule. Most people really engage. I like looking. I like, you know, liking things. You guys here know that I'll comment every now and again on some stuff within the group, which is really where I reside. I love seeing the kids' photos and my buddies from high school and, you know, all that. But I don't, I've never, you know, 
I, you know, people make fun of the people that, you know, take a picture of their dinner. You ever notice that? I mean, I, I know if you guys don't know that it actually happens. If you put your dinners on, people are making fun of it and it's okay. Like keep putting them on. I think I wouldn't make fun of that because that's to me is a positive message. I mean, honestly, it's like, I like this. So, you know, how do you represent yourself uh, online? Um, we had, I had a friend of mine who texted something pretty nasty to somebody else, another friend of mine. And I was shocked at the age of this person that they are still like, still would send something that's static that never goes away. Right. So this becomes practical in that we are an e-commerce business. We, people have the ability to research. They have the ability to go into Google and type in your name or search you on LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter. Are you a person that represents themselves as a person who likes people? I mean, there's a lot of people who aren't. And I don't know. I, listen, I first of all, I only really know probably outside of staff, three or four people on this call right now. And I didn't look. So I'm not coming from any place uh, other than abstract, which is how do we represent ourselves every day? And I know we get down to, and it can be kind of frustrating at times when people get down to, wait a minute, how do I sell a bottle of 3,500? It's like, whoa, you're down where the ball meets the bat. There's a lot that has to happen before that bat is in a position to make contact with the ball. Preparation met with opportunity, success, right? So I want us to, yes, keep this conceptual talk going through these. I, I like that better than nuts and bolts. Um, and one of the reasons I don't do nuts and bolts, and I've told you guys this a hundred times, I'm not out there doing it. I can only speak to the conceptual human condition and definite hard, you know, uh, tried and true uh, of tools in a communication line that actually put us, put ourselves in a better position for success. But certainly this is practical when it comes to you're looking for yeses, right? You're looking to build a relationship. We have confirmed over and over and over that even though our, 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 our goal certainly is to make sales and, and get the hand, CBD in the hands of people, we understand that there's a huge landscape that precedes that. And sometimes you make contact and somebody buys one right away. And then there's a landscape that postcedes that, that needs to happen for long-term success. And we did a study years ago, Leandro, uh, the, the gross disparity between people, and at this time, I think it was about 10, 12 years ago. So hundred grand a year back then meant more than it does now. And it's still, I mean, you make hundred thousand dollars, you, you can have a good living. There's a huge disparity and I won't, uh, I'll just talk about the disparity, not the actual statistic because it was so long ago. I don't even know if they're relevant anymore, but back then there was such a small amount of people do you know if you want to be in the top 1% in this country in income, do you know what that number is? Does anybody? Take some guesses. You can chat it. You can yell it out. Take some guesses. Of if, if You've heard they'll say, oh, you know, the, the other one, the, the 1%, the 1%. What amount of income would it take to be the top 1% income earner in this country? 200,000. How much? 200,000. 200? What do you think, Leandro? No wrong answer. I mean, there is a wrong answer, but nobody's going to blame you. I'm saying seven figures. Seven figures, a million dollars. Okay. Anybody else want to take a stab at it? It's it's in the middle there. It's three. When I looked at it, it was three hundred forty grand. Okay. Three hundred forty grand. Do you know what it is uh, globally? Forty-two thousand to be in the top one percent globally. Oh, isn't that amazing? Wow. Yeah, and I looked at this a couple of years ago. So you can look. You can look now. Just Google it. You know, top one percent global income. It'll, it'll tell you the number. The point is, why is that? That means we're all rich. Huh? That it means does. we're all rich. Even the, uh, even the poor people here are better than Globally. I mean, right? I, was, I told my dad once, I said, man, I'm going to move to Nicaragua with the money exchange. I can live like a king. He's like, problem <laughs> is kings don't live all that great there. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. Um, golly, that was awesome, Dana. So <laughs> why is it? There, there's no way. Think of your sphere of influence is are nine people inefficient and incapable and there's just one genius person out of 10? Like the, the number, the results of income, if that's the measurement, and at some point that's the measurement, um, it doesn't jive with the, a ratio of people in my life that are really capable, really smart, really talented. What is the difference? It's not that 1% or 2% or 3% of the people come out of the womb with a better skill set that makes them like they're just destined to be in that top three or five percent. Why is there such a disparity? Anybody? It's one word. 
in my mind. Now, there's probably more than one right answer. In fact, I know there is, but I'm thinking of one word. Well, what is that? An answer. Rich in the spirit. Okay. Yes. And how? Do, there she goes again. <laughs> so sweet. Um, rich in spirit. Yes. Again. So here, there's really are no wrong answers. I'm thinking of one, and one way that that like that we that it's something we can actually do. Like it's practical, but it's counterintuitive. Because we want to adjust our bat to, to hit the ball. And we don't want to think about what is my... So anybody else? Any Before I give it away? I think it's attitude. Attitude, yes. Which is a part of the word. Uh -huh. My word is thinking. What I have learned, and you all, I'm telling you this. I have had the great benefit of being able to be mentored by some really, really amazing uh, men and women, actually, in my life. And I have always been a great observer of people. Um, I do so very quietly, but I definitely pick up a lot through people. And the only thing that I've seen different, I've seen men with lesser talent. Um, you know, if you're around them, they're not engineers. They're not, you know, mental giants. They don't, they're not solving Pythagorean theorems in their mind. But they think in a fashion that allows them to be successful. And again, we have to define, I I pose money because it's an easy measuring stick, but we have to define what success is for us. It's different for everybody. It, it, it really is. We have some people here, I am telling you, that make four to $500 a month and they are ecstatic because that's, I can think of one old school, like her vacations are always paid through this. And it's something that she has done and it just kind of happens on its own. She's not, you know, out there bird dogging every day. And we, I have one lady who just loves, she actually bought a new car because she makes at least, even in her recurring business, $350 a month. So her car payment was like $349 or something. She's like, I beat it by a dollar. Over. So everybody's got their own success. The reason I didn't script some hard um, static notes for this is because I want us to think during this session and in future sessions, what does my online profile look like? And listen, if it looks like you know everything on there is a political nature or whatever, I'm not, I'm not judging you at all. I, all I'm talking about is like, how is that relate to getting you to where you want to go? And you might say, Matthew, here's how it relates to where I want to go. Here's my definition of success. And I am the exception to the rule. And I am going to post things that I'm opposed to because I believe it's getting me to a destination. I would love to have that conversation with you and not from a cynical standpoint, but I would love to be educated on how you think because I don't understand that, how that's gonna get you to any level of success that's in the positive. To me, multiple negatives don't make a positive. Double negatives do, so, huh, right? Yes. So how do we translate what we're learning into our everyday life? That's the question I have. That's the question you should have. Yes, is, is this quadrant two time? Is there just the value in the time spent in association? Absolutely. But my hope is that we can engage in some dialogue or at least I can cause you to start a thought process that gets you to the point where it's like, I'm actually using this stuff and not for the sake of selling CBD, but for the sake of being a more influential person in your life to the people around you. Because to me, again, I, I remember I told you once I had a mentor named Tim Goad, amazing guy, so talented. And I asked him, how do you, achieve uh, excellence in these three categories as, as a man, as a, my family life, my work life, and my spiritual life? Like, I thought that was a great question. And he said, your, your thinking's all wrong, Pitts. And I said, how so, Tim? And he goes, it's not three things. It's all one thing. You, you, you're not, we can't, that, that's, a, that's a counterintuitive nature. We think that, oh, my business life is here. When I go to work, I'm this person. When I come home, I'm this person. When I go to church, I'm this person. I can tell you no better place to find evidence of that thought process is in a church. I'm, hey, listen, I'm a believer. I love church. I'm not bad mouthing it, but I'm telling you, no more hypocrisy have I ever seen so coagulated in one area than a church. And because in the minds of those people, when they go to church, they're a different person. That's a different lane. And it's not. And that stunts their spiritual growth. Now, I know I'm not talking to all believers. You can associate or predicate that same theory and thought process over any walk of life. So my goal is not, I've told you guys this before, and I learned this through Nicaragua having interpreters, and God really used that to create in me an awareness that I don't want to just be heard. I have no desire to get on here and do, do 50 minutes to an hour uh, every week 
just for the sake of doing it. As a matter of fact, I get done with this, I got to run to my chiropractor, and then I got to run back because I'm doing a call with Nicaraguan, my Nicaraguan pastor. And so I'm not in a position where I want to hear myself be heard. I'm in a position where I want this to make a difference. At some point, if there's not buy-in and then action, then I want to know what the stumbling block is. Matthew, I want to do this, or, or I disagree with this thing that you're saying, or it's that this doesn't work for me. I want to hear that if that's what you're feeling, because we need to identify, you know, in sales, if somebody ever said no, I mean, a question I always ask is, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Prospect, uh, tell me exactly what you're uncomfortable with. What, what, what is the, the reason? What's the holdup? What is keeping you from making this decision? What is keeping you from, from implementing some of these uh, humanistic, you know, intuition? I mean, if you know that we're egotistical, you know we're emotional before we're analytical, you know that, you know, telling people they're wrong is probably not going to get you, you know, further your influence to that person. We know that people like people who like people. We know that we should seek to find similarities. We know that we should get people to say yes. We know all these things because there's a human condition that's very real. And it's almost like learning a game. And, and I, I, I've known guys and I can be that guy. Like if I learn, a, if I, like the IRS, but I don't ever want to break the law with my taxes, but I want to toe that line of legality. And the only way to really toe that line is to know the rules. I don't know them. So what do you do? You hire the best damn accountant you can find that knows the rules and knows how to use those rules to our advantage. That's what this is. There are humanistic rules. There's exceptions to every rule. We get that. But when we know these rules, then we can toe the line of human condition. And listen, it's not about selling CBD. It's about acquiring and magnetizing and associating with people of like, kind, and interest. And we talked about it earlier, too, about having a representative. Oh, if I go into a room, I don't want them to see all my flaws. You ain't ever going to make a real friend unless they know. John Maxwell said once he got done with a big, and I saw the conference that he did where he tells you, he said, go to your people, your employees, your, you know, your organization members, whatever your role is, and let them know your deficiencies. Let them know the things that you know that are wrong that you're working on in yourself. And a couple, a bunch of the executives came up and they're like, hey, John, man, I don't agree with that. And I would love to hear that. I love it when people, you know, don't take my word for it. They, hey, John, I don't agree. I mean, we're supposed to be infallible, we're supposed to be strong, and da 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 And John goes, here's where your thinking's wrong, see? You think they don't know. You're not you're not exposing this to them. You're not educating them. They already know your weaknesses. You're just letting them know that you know. So you have to have an openness and a vulnerability. And that comes, it's hard to be, and you have to, you know, we talk about being lavish with praise and abundant in, in, our, in our friendship. And, and I'm telling you, I don't associate you all. I am not, this is not a righteous thing at all. It's just a clarification. The reason I don't associate with social media is I don't like the energy. I don't, I mean, I can, I have conformed my Facebook to where I only see what I want to see, which is great. But I like Twitter. I like following, you know, Elon Musk and World of Engineering. And there's some really cool stuff out there. But I can't get away from the negativity. And I'm going to say this and then I'll give you guys a chance to talk or, 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 or give input. I said it the other day to my hairdresser, Stephanie, and she's a, a good friend of mine. Um, she's a great, great woman, younger lady, got a great husband. We just, and Stacy goes to her and, um, and James does too. So we're almost keeping her afloat financially. And we feel good about that. But anyway, I was telling St or, uh, Stephanie about, she's like, said something about me kind of always being calm. And, and I went in and I had one of these grief moments while I was getting a haircut. And I was telling Stephanie something and I thought to myself, I go, why the hell? And when I tell my hairdresser this, she's a friend of mine, but then she leaves to go, <coughs> she usually books me when she has to do a color. So I guess some lady's waiting for an hour for her hair to dry or something. And that's when she does me. And so she had to go kind of do something with that lady. And as she was gone, I realized, and I was like, I now know it's like, I don't have my dad like to tell that stuff to like, there's a whole, like I would, and it's like, Hey, tell your wife. No, 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 no. They, I believe that trying to, to seek 100% fulfillment from our spouse puts our spouse at a gross disadvantage, an unwinnable position. Uh, there's no such thing as a spouse or a mate or partner giving us 100% fulfillment. We, we have to find areas of our life to fulfill outside of our marriage. Uh, for me, certainly there's a, a spiritual element that only Jesus can fill. You know, if we're athletic and we have an energy and we like competing, that you know, we have to fulfill that competition typically outside of our marriage, just as, as examples. So it's not a crack on Stacey. It's not at all. Our marriage is as good as it's ever been. There's certain things that I wouldn't look for fulfillment from her. And I found it in my dad. I never knew it. 
right? I, I, like I didn't know it. And so she laughed and I'm literally getting, I'm, I'm at the, she's getting ready to do my hair and I'm at the thing and I could feel tears running down my, my face as I'm sitting there thinking of my dad. And I thought the, the reason I'm telling you this is because Stephanie's reaction to that vulnerability, even though we're such good friends, was so sweet and tender. And although I didn't intend that, it was one of those breezes that opened up the wound and I just, it was an amazingly uh, sad moment. Me being vulnerable and open in front of her, really, I mean, there's, there weren't words like, oh, a relationship is really enhanced. It didn't happen like that. But man, there was, there's a different connection now. Even to where Stacy went in and had her hair cut a couple of days later, and Stacy came and said, man, and Stephanie said, your husband was just so sweet, so amazing. And it's just because I was vulnerable. And again, I didn't intend on it. It just happened. But isn't like, I, I'm definitely a guarded guy. Like, I feel like, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but is everybody naturally kind of guarded? I mean, I know I am. Would yeses or no? So I think that's a great example of how when we get out of bed, and in a book, in a book, it says to, uh, to capture every thought. Like, you, we need to renew our minds every day. And I do believe that. I believe that every day, that's why we talk. That's why I started out with listing your, where do you want to go? What, 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 what goals do you need to accomplish to get there? Let's write those down. Let's get moving. Because if we don't have something in front of us every day, it gets lost. It just does. There's reasons why there's so many books about I, I was a, a, had a mentor one time by the name of Andy. And Andy said that everybody has, when they go to bed at night, a reset button mentally that they click and they wake up and maybe they didn't lose a hundred percent of what they retained that day, but the next day they're starting from, from pretty low and they got to build it up again. And that's why, you know, 30 days is a habit. It's like, you have to continue doing it. If you stop, you lose it. It's almost like muscle, right? What happens when you stop using a muscle? You lose it. Exactly. I'm going to take a sip, ask for any uh, comments, questions, errors, omissions, additions, cares, concerns. Everybody's very much in tune. With Tanya, you sure look nice today. You're dolled up, aren't you? You're muted. And do you play the drums? You're muted still. I, I did my first video today. Good. Um, I don't know. That's why I put makeup on. <laughs> <laughs> I put my contacts on to try to look kind of cute, doll my hair up or whatever. And I could... I have to reach these people. I'm like, okay. And I had some background music. Oh. Matthew, I had some background music. I played some of my homeboys from Ohio, some Lakeside. I played some All The Way Live. I said, because y'all not listening to or looking at my, my posts, I got to come All The Way Live every Thursday. That's awesome. Thursday, Knowledgeable Thursdays with Tanja. That's what it's called. That's awesome. Hey, do you play the drum? Thursdays with Tanja. Are you the percussionist? <laughs> My, my, you see the drums in the back? I, I see the cymbals. Yeah, I can see the cymbals. Yeah, that's that's Michael. Yeah, Michael's a percussionist. He's an architect by day and a jazz drummer by night. Oh, I'm the I'm the chemist with you know, and it's really funny because um, he balances me out and I balance him out. Yeah. After being married to a military man for years, it's so wonderful to be in love. <laughs> <laughs> and not to have a lot of the. <laughs> You know, it's just wonderful. But yeah, that's his awesome. drum set. Michael's a cancer survivor. I talked a little bit about him in my video. And um, cancer cannot survive in vibration. So we put the, <laughs> the drum set is outside of the kitchen. <laughs> that's awesome. He cooks, plays while I cook. <laughs> it's cool. It's good. Uh, and it's jazz fun. drum is tough. I mean, it's so all over the place yeah. and eclectic and... I can play a little bit. I can keep a four two. I can keep time, but I would never be able to do the jazz riffs. That's that's yeah. outside of my pay grade. Yeah, it's Tanja. A, yes, ma'am. I mean, you, I love have you forgiven you forgiven him for uh, ordering CBD off of some yes, TV ad? I know. Tanya. He better sitting right here. I'm like, okay, <laughs> no. <laughs> he better not order nothing else from anybody else. Good you know, thing you love him so much. Yeah, uh, yeah no doubt, right? <laughs> we respected each other. You know what I mean? Because Michael didn't know what was going on with him. And just to tell a brief story, I'm gonna get off. I'm not gonna say a lot. But um, when I met Michael, I was in the beginning stages of my um horrible divorce, and Michael had something going on with him. So I said, okay, we're gonna go to lunch. But I didn't take him to lunch. I took him to the doctor. 
and that woke him up. And like a lot of men don't want to go to the doctor. And that woke him up and he went to VCU Urology Center. And that's when we found out he was in the first stages of bladder cancer. Okay. Oh, wow. And he's saved. I've changed the diet. Me, the chemistry person. I went in the kitchen. I said, we got to do vegan. We went to go Yogaville. We talked to a lady. I think she was psychic. She was wonderful. But sometimes I do sneak a pork chop thing out. <laughs> Can I ask you a question? Can you hear me? Yes, yes ma'am. Ma Why are you, Patrice? I'm great. You look you look gorgeous. I didn't even recognize you. My girl, I put that video on my video. I was like, oh my god, I gotta do this video. <laughs> Let me. How do we? Can we listen to your video? Is this is this on CBD? I, I posted it on our, our on our website. Oh, um, good. Thank you. Jill, let me help me help me help me direct me how to do that. I love Jill. She helped me how to do that. I posted it to my friends who are making me sick because they're not buying anything from me. And they're in, oh, half of them, I talked to them, they're sick. They need it. You know, I talked to a girlfriend of mine that it's just basically, she's diabetic, she's 5'1", she's 170 pounds. She was on metamorphin. I'm like, okay, now she's taking insulin. I'm like, baby girl, come on. You're a beautiful girl from high school. We were pretty girls in high school. I said, like, let's get off of this. You know, I got to educate. I just started out like, um, like um, Stacy said, start out with your own personal story, and that's what my story is about today on the post. And next week I'll do something else. I'll have another product, and I'm a comedian. Okay, I maybe have a product hanging from my boobs, or maybe the immunity boost or something hanging from my forehead or whatever. And I'll just use some more makeup. <laughs> that's, and Tom, that's on your Facebook page. <laughs> I put it. I put on our CBD page, CBD page, and my Facebook page. Oh, cool. On our yes. on our business page, our CBD. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Was okay, Dave. It took. It was a conspiracy for me to figure out how to do this crap. I am not. I am not computer literate. I had to drink about four glasses of wine. I'm not gonna lie. Okay. It's. it's and um. That's what I'm like, okay, this is confusing. <laughs> but I got it. Just, I want feedback. <laughs> I want feedback. And next week will be better. And then the week after that, it'll be better. I get it. <laughs> so right, I hold on, hold on. I, 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 a, a vote. I say Tanya hosts next week thir on Thursday. She's a heck of a lot more entertaining than I am. No, 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 no. seriously. Oh my God. I, I'm I'm the comedian. Yeah. Yeah. My, my friend, as you asked about Matthew, my friend, he um has a jazz band and, and Stacy's one of my friends on Facebook and she saw my son Miles. He named his band Milestone after my son. Cool. And, um, oh but my he God. doesn't know how to market anything. I'm like, just go be the architect. Just go upstairs. That's what made me Yeah. I'm like, okay, just go away. Okay, but um he got it together. <laughs> Help me with some of the, help me with some of the technical stuff, but we have to know where we are. Like you're talking about every Thursday, Matthew. You're talking about we got to know our strengths and weaknesses. And when we don't have um, a strength, as I was a manager for a long time, I would pull people in that I had the strength that I did not have. Okay, and it's that's called being a good manager because you know, okay, you know you're good at this, so you know I'll bring you along board with me, and we will make this do what it do. You know, so yeah. you have to know that as well. Um, but Michael helps me with the, um, the, the the other aspects of this. And, you know, business moving slow. We're not open. Like, you guys are open. Virginia yeah. shut down. We went out for Valentine's Day. I was like, okay, I can sit at the bar and get a drink. My way for our food. They gave me a paper cup and sent me to my car and told me I had to go outside to a roundaway window and order our, thanks, our, 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 our Valentine's Day dinner, if you will. I'm like, oh, my God. So it's really difficult. But let me tell you. I use my cards. I'm going to get the new cards and I have samples stapled to them. And when I go to Kroger and Lowe's, when I can go in and I give everybody samples and there try to go. get the product. And it, it's going to come. It's going to come. I just want to be like Dana when I grow up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? Yeah. <laughs> but thank you for letting me share. I love everybody. <laughs> oh, hey, you're going to get a, a just a planned spot every week. It's like yeah. uh, two minutes of time. That's what we're gonna do. Two yes. minutes of time. Every two week. Two minutes of time. Okay. Two minutes of time. I got my stuff situated. I got a notebook product I'm gonna use next week on Thursdays. And Patrice, how are Alami as your pharmaceutical sales rep previously before? You know, if, if you're here, um 513 680 4045. Repeat that. Repeat it. Okay. 513 680 4045. 
I live in Richmond, but I'm originally from Cincinnati, Ohio. I never gave up anything. So holla at me. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew, for giving Thank me this you, time. Tanya. Very much appreciate it. <laughs> okay. So it begs the question though, right? That Tanya got out of her comfort zone. Glenn Brown's kind of the guy who started, or maybe Dana did. Dana started. Then Glenn Brown, we heard of, and I know there are more that we haven't heard of, but isn't that interesting? I mean, if people say, hey, when I do this 30 second stupid video, I get interest, I get activity, I make sales. Isn't that interesting that, and listen, I don't know who has done or who has not done it, so I'm not picking on anybody, but why wouldn't you do it? Like that's that's the, the barrier of this human condition and how it, so the things that we're supposed to do we typically don't do, and we engage in. If you guys remember the story I told you about the uh, about Hans, the therapist, right? Like, oh, I'll show him. Like, I was ready and convinced that not going to see that guy was going to show him up. When it took Bob, the director, to say, "Hey, Pitts, you tell me who's going to be hurt or injured by you not showing up." My man's young, he's talented, and he gets paid whether you show up for your session or not. And it's like it just made sense to me, and I wonder. How many times we do or do not engage in activities that we know are going to or, or not going to help us get where we want to go? And I must say, a lot of times it's emotion. And if we can call, you know, I don't want to get into the semantics of what emotions truly are. Certainly that's its own other conversation. But, you know, if fear is an emotion, then that's a, a stumbling block. And I wonder, how do we def how does everybody look at fear? And I, usually it's hard to ask that kind of question in, um, in a setting, like a training setting. And I, I'll give you an example. One of the things, reasons I've, it wasn't the reason, but one of the reasons I think I'm not actively pursuing going back to teaching at church, like Bible study and stuff, which I did for years, is that it's hard to get to a place where people are authentic. Usually when you ask a question like that, people are giving answers that they believe you want to hear. And I call it stage talk, right? It's like, no, but, you know, even when I was a kid, I would love when some girl would ask a question that I wanted to ask, but I was too insecure to ask it. Does that make sense? So, hold on a second. Oh, my God, excuse me. I got something in my throat. So why is it? And I think if we take, I don't know that it's going to work like if just one day you're going to start thinking about it, but based on some of the history that we have of really analyzing, you know, human condition and self-introspection, what you know, what is our definition? How do we view fear? Um, to me, and again, I don't want to ask that question. Like, well, fear you overcome, fear this. And, and I taught for years, you guys, and erroneously so, I believe now, that fear was an absence of faith, right? You put, you know, it's like when you were little and you woke up from a nightmare and what did your mom say? Just forget about it. Just, you know, move it away. And again, I mentioned something earlier that forgetting about it or um, ignoring it is not the way to handle those internal thoughts. Um, we are to capture those thoughts. We are to, to renew our mind. So if we're looking at fear, to me, it's one of the biggest causes that people don't do things. But if we understand what it is, it truly is, oh my gosh, opportunity a lot of times sneaks in the back door um, disguised as a, 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 a failure, disguised as fear, disguised as um, as problems, when those can be real opportunities. In other words, I don't think fear is an absence of faith. I think faith is fear walking. I know we're not all believers here, but the backbone of my thought process is that in a book in a book, it says the beginning of all wisdom is fear of the Lord. So again, this is just my background, but I, it doesn't matter. I, I'll get to a place where it's relevant for everyone. When think about in the days of, you know, where there were saber tooth tigers and, you know, if you believe, you know, caveman walks out and he's scared of a saber tooth tiger, there's a, that fear is healthy. It's meant to turn us away from that. Does that make sense? If you have a huge fear of walking to the edge of a cliff, that's, that's a healthy fear. Would you agree with me? It's like, I don't want to fall. So I'm, I'm, I'm peeling back to safety. But I believe that we need to analyze that that fear has two components. One of them is it's an emotion that was in that we we're hardwired to, I believe, be very beneficial to our health and success and, and survival. But it crosses a line when that fear keeps us from becoming who we are meant to be. And if you if I see somebody who is unwilling 
to has under uh, have an understanding that they have a, a desire to do something, right? They have a goal. They're they're wanting to achieve, not doing this for 20 seconds. I'm not belittling that fear. It's very real. I want us to examine it and why it's so damn powerful. Why is it so powerful? What about anger? I had a guy, Tom Smith, once tell me that anger was not an emotion, which I totally disagree with. I think it is an emotion, but I don't think it's a primary emotion. I think it's a product. I think it's a secondary emotion for something else. When I get up in the morning or in the middle of the night and I stub my toe, my first reaction is I'm pissed. Pain, right? Being hurt, not only physically, but emotionally. How about being embarrassed? How about being uh, disrespected? Anger to me is a secondary emotion. But here's the cool part, you guys. Oh, see, like that's just one little level. Go down a little bit deeper. Say you're reading about human trafficking and you're incensed every time. Oh, I mean, we have in Florida, we have a place called Immokalee, which is a, a real hub of it. So we have a lot of uh, missionary work that happens in and around Immokalee, Florida. If you're reading that and you're angered, I don't think that's a bad emotion. That may be the very emotion that leads you. It's like a light going, hey, man, I want to get involved and make a difference here. What if you read the paper every day and you get, you're so angered by injustice? Well, instead of, boy, see how I come all the way back around Leandro? And I don't mean that braggadocious. I mean, it's, it's a go-God moment. Instead of posting and letting everyone know what we're angry about, why don't we allow that anger to draw us to make a difference in that very category that we're angered by? If you're angry with a certain politician, go to a rally, go vote, go do whatever. If you're angry about human trafficking, make a difference. If you're angry about homelessness, go out and feed somebody. Use that anger for a positive. When we use that anger just to spew, all it does in my mind is, is it multiplies exponentially the anger that we have within us especially, listen, there are times in my life when I will complain. I very rarely do. And I'm talking about sending a letter, email, or I had a bad experience. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing to do. That's just not me. I just, I don't do that. I don't, because I'd rather it turn into something constructive. Does that make sense? So if, if I complain though, and the, one of the reasons that I don't, I'll give you an example. We went to, oh, this is a horrible example, Leandro. Why am I doing this one? I, it's the only one that's coming to mind. We were at a, it was just many years ago, we went to a, a resort, uh, me and about four other families all had these condos, and somebody took a poop in the pool. <laughs> and my buddy Todd, man, he was insane. Todd, yeah. you know, Todd, he was so, he didn't stop talking about it like half the day. I can't, I'm going to go complain. I said, Todd, th there's always a long line of people to complain. You got 50 other condo you know, dwellers here. Yeah. Why be that guy? That's my thing. Now there are times when I'm not saying never complain. I don't mean that, but only when it's going to make a difference. But I believe that people complain for the sake of complaining. And this, I will say is condescending. It's shocking to me. It's shocking to me that anybody thinks their opinion matters to anybody. And that's, what's amazing to me. Nobody cares. Oh, I don't like this. Sucks to be you. What the hell do you want me to do about it? I'm serious. Like, it makes no sense to me. I don't, if you can find, I mean, are you making money from it? Is there a redeeming quality? Are you achieving a, a title? What's the game? I don't get it. And to me, it, it, it drives me crazy because, I, oh, that's why I don't do it. That's why I can't, I can't be around people like that. And you might say, oh, you think you're better. Maybe I do. I mean, I'll be authentic. Maybe I do. I'm, and better and worse is linear. I am different. I am different. And I choose not to participate. I told somebody the other day, if it was, if it was I, I boycotted Walmart years ago. Let's call it Target. I pull up to a Target. I don't go looking for the front 10 spots. I go, because you, you know, normally you pull in the side or the back, right? You don't, you got a long way to go to get to the front. I stop right here. First of all, because I'm, I'm, I'm able, I can walk. Second of all, have y'all noticed there's a horrible negative energy for about 100 feet away from that front door. People jockeying, people mad and angry, and it just is there, and I don't want to participate. And you know what? That's my choice. And I talked about it the other day. But it was So I got to go back to my hairdresser. She's like, you know, talking about somebody 
you know, spewing negative and this and that. And I go, listen, just tell them if they want to draw you into it, literally say these words. I choose not to participate. You do what you want. I'm not going to participate. I'm not going to give away the authority of my emotions, my psychological, emotional well-being over to somebody else. Be like a kid, right? I remember you tell James when he's like six, seven, why'd you do this? Oh, she made me do it. It's like, no, she didn't, you idiot. You did it. In the minute we believe that someone else has authority to make us do something, do you know we have zero problem solving ability? That's a neurological, biological fact. Because other areas of our brain, the victimhood is a survival mechanism. That's not a problem solving. That is a defensive mechanism. And we are wired for that. So the minute we give someone else authority, we lose our problem solving abilities. And it makes no sense to me. So I know I get a little worked up, but I'm thinking of some of the things that I read online. It's like, I love it when the celebrity says, oh, so-and-so is president. I'm leaving America. Who cares? How what? It doesn't that prove what we've learned and that we are just the most egotistical, narcissistic beings. And we can be. They have engaged and you know, superstardom is a different stratosphere of life and a different perspective. So it's like senators, po powerful politicians who commit crimes and feel like they're never going to get caught. That's called narcissism. That's real. Like any normal human being, though, you have to know that your name is right there. Like it's going to come up. But then you have situations like, uh, what was it, Chicago's mayor, Marion Barry, smoking crack, stealing money, goes to jail, comes out. What does he do? Gets reelected. <laughs> so what I'm saying is that, that engaging in this type of thought process does make us different. It does pull us. It, I'm telling you, that's why there's 3%, 2%, 1%. It's not a talent. Talent is never enough. It, it has very little to do with that. I've had talent my whole life. You know, I've been rich, broke, rich, broke my entire life. Why now? It's because 20 years ago, I started really caring about how I thought. And it took about 10 years for it to settle in and, and manifest itself. And listen, ladies, gentlemen, it ain't gonna take you 10 years. I'm very stubborn. <laughs> I'm very slow to move. I mean, if God needs me to do something a year from now, he's gonna talk to me about it now. This is gonna take me about that long to be like, okay, God. So I'm not saying it takes 10 years. What I am saying that, if we don't focus on this and understand its practical application in, in every, not everything, but at least in some part of our walk every day, it's not going to matter. If you do, then I would submit that you take and we take the mindset of a farmer. You know, I love a farmer, my favorite person in the world, man. I love the hard work because when you think of farming, you think of hard work, right? There's, I've never seen a farmer that doesn't work hard. I love the faith that it takes. I love the, uh, uh, the the uh, discipline to do things when they're supposed to in the season that they're supposed to. I'm telling you, metaphorically, a farmer is like the best thing in the world. And we have to be like a farmer. When we first start getting into this, we're tilling the soil. As we continue and engage in, in, in through discipline, stay with it. Stay with it. Because we live in a microwave society. And a lot of times when people don't get results right away, that's when that's why all these books like, you know, Two Feet from Gold were written. And these people that stopped just short of their success. because and I got to close with this because it's late after you guys, if you want to say something. There's typically an emotion that's high when we make a decision to do something, to engage in an activity. The challenge is human condition causes that emotion is going to dip. It's going to go down. If we don't have a real passion and, and if we're just working for money, when this emotion gets low, the energy also falls with it. Passion fuels energy. Passion fuels energy. So if we have a passion to help people, which I know everybody here does, we have so many amazing people that are, that is their role. We engage in this activity and discipline. My definition is long after that emotion under which we made this decision passes, we continue the activity that we decided to engage in. That's discipline. And that's the difference between the one to three and 97% is continuing to engage in that emotion is down and results have not yet gone up and there is a gap there and you might say well how long is that gap eh, who knows as long as it takes right so that's the gap where people quit and if you do any kind of studies the emotion typically can last on its own about six to eight months sometimes a year in the right culture but if you don't have a real passion and you don't find yourself in that and find another reason other than the emotion to keep the passion, to keep the energy going. Um, that's why you have so many people that have one year, eight months, 
12 months, 14 months, you know, job, 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 because the grass is greener on the other side, right? Because now it just got hard. Now I'm not waking up every day with this emotion to go to work. I realize the fallacies of it or to go do what I'm doing. So it takes this kind of study to mold our thinking so that we understand that and we don't fall into the rut that 97% of Americans fall in. And again, I'm only using an economic metric, right? So, you know, it's, it's more theory than anything. Uh, I believe that economic metric is right, but this isn't about economics. This is about a passion of yours. I mean, maybe it's a lifestyle you want. Maybe it's, you know, like Dana, I know her passion to kids and really helping people. And I know Tanya, I know your passions and Beatrice and, you know, Val and those of you who have spoken up, we've heard that. And that's what drives it. That's why Glenn Brown, Glenn's been with for three years. We didn't hear from him for a year and a half. All of a sudden he's a superstar. Why? He just kept going. He's a farmer, man. He's a farmer. He just kept going. And he's a tradesman. They're usually tip, they're usually tougher than office guys like me. <laughs> like, oh, my fingers hurt. I am in a powerful tunnel. <laughs> Glenn's like, my badge broken. <laughs> Glenn has a comment. Yeah. Um, nothing like being judged by someone who doesn't know you. That shouldn't matter then. Yeah. I love it when somebody I don't know calls me a name and be like, all right, you don't even know who I am. Mm -hmm. Now, if my wife says something like that, I've probably got a problem. You know what I mean? If Leandro comes up and says something like that, I might have a problem. Also, I don't, let me think of something more politically correct than the example that just came in my way. You guys don't understand how many filters have. <laughs> Every word has to go through before it's it's uh, before it's approved yeah, for release. Think. All right, I'm trying to think of something. Okay, well, all right. Uh, this I think this is more political threat. If a guy's got five or a gal has five divorces, and they say something negative to you about marriage, do you care? You know, I'll tell you what the the politically incorrect one's better. It, it's more illustrative and it's a lot more fun. But in an open forum, I don't think it would be cool. I've already gotten in trouble once or twice, Leandro. I'm growing and developing and learning. I am not the same man I was a year ago before you. That was meant to be a joke for trees, Patris. Patris was like, no, you're not. <laughs> All right, anything Anything else? We're straight up on it. I got a chiropractor appointment in 15 minutes. Yes, um, Victor here is laughing, saying, I was dry for a while. Just keep on swimming. Just got a new customers and a few decides and decide what side of the fence will you be on. Yep. And Either push, yep. push a pull. Being on the fence ain't gonna work. I love that. That's really good. Makes me think of Dory. Yeah. Just keep swimming. Yep. Just keep swimming. I gotta stop doing that stuff. Go ahead. Yeah. It's a. Yeah. It's, yeah. Right. it's me. It's me. That's right. Or I could be. And again. <laughs> Welcome to today's trip. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, yeah. Wearing them like dreadlocks. Love it, girl. <laughs> I like dreads falling in your face, girl. <laughs> hey, you guys have a great uh, week. We will see you next Monday. Um, you guys all have my email, right? If you need me or have a question, please email me. I'm available to you guys. Uh, I'm, I'm not the quickest responder, but I do so. Right, Leandro? Thank you for affirming me. Hey, we really hope you feel better, you Glenn. We miss you. We hope you feel better. We need yeah, to see you. And, and again, thank you, Glenn, for the wonderful gifts. Uh, it was so special that your daughter made those. So thank you again. It was really, really cool. Appreciate you, dude. All of you guys, appreciate you. You make Thursdays worth it. Have a